everyone. I'm Janie. Um, I work for a feminist campaign organisation called Level Up. Um, and as if any of you came yesterday, we tend to target culture for social change as opposed to the law um, because it moves faster. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about how we have started to change. There's still work to do, but we started to change the way that fatal domestic abuse is reported in the UK press. Um, this is the Level Up team. We're a small feminist campaign group. Um, here are a couple of examples of our campaigns. So one of them is around football. Um, we've flown planes over football matches to protest sexual violence in sports. Um, yesterday I spoke about this, but we have campaigned to get plastic surgery and diet pill adverts taken off primetime TV. Um, and this is what I'll talk to you about today, which is when we introduced the UK's first media guidelines on reporting fatal domestic abuse. So... Do any of you know the names of the two women whose pictures are bigger? I'm wondering if this like, resonates outside the UK, yeah? She was uh, murdered? Yeah, she was murdered, yeah. Uh huh. Okay, so. So both of these women, um, the one at the top is called Sabina Nessa, and the one at the bottom is called Sarah Everard. They were both murdered. Um, in the last year in the UK, and their cases were all over the press. I must say, Sarah Everard had much more attention because she was white. There were very clear racial disparities in that. But both of these cases got media attention because the women were killed by strangers. Now, statistically, 94% of women who are murdered in the UK are murdered by their partner. And they're the stories that I'm going to be talking to you about today. And so, you know, these are the women who are pictured behind, some of whom we don't know. Some of, we don't know their names. Their cases never got reported on um, because that's not how the media narrative or the cultural narratives around violence against women work. We're told stranger danger. We're told, you know, get home safe. But we're not told, actually, is the person that you're building a life and a partnership with the greatest threat to your own existence? So, these are the statistics on domestic homicide in the UK. There's one woman killed every three days, and it's a public health problem. It's often not seen in that way, but it is. People are dying. Um, the important thing to know about domestic abuse, so when someone kills their partner or partner, it is the end point to a sustained period of controlling behaviour that escalates over time. There are so many criminologists who have the facts on this, we know it's predictable. And one of the biggest predictors of someone being murdered by a partner is separation. So 72% of women are killed within six months of separating from an abusive partner. 49% are killed within one month, um, and 90% are killed within one year. So it's very clear to anyone who knows what they're looking at that it's an act of control. It doesn't come out of the blue. And yet, this is how the press in the UK were reporting the problem. So there's a headline format here that we saw was really common, which was, you know, man kills woman after her actions. We saw it again and again. The most sensational, you know, ones, some of them are included here. Some of them are even worse. Uh, but ultimately, it was an issue that was... Not accurate, because that wasn't what happened. There had been a long history before that that was not being reported on. And two, it ultimately blames the woman for her own death. So we knew we had to do something to change it. This is from an internal document. Um, the change that we wanted to see was to end the victim-blaming, salacious way domestic violence is reported by introducing a strict editorial code for journalists. And our vision as feminists was that the media doesn't reinforce the killer's narrative because that's what was happening. They were quoting his version of events. Because the woman's dead, she didn't have a chance to respond and, and correct the truth. And that was what was being circulated across our media landscape. And that's what informs our cultural conversations around how we understand violence against women. So instead of you know, these articles being an opportunity to actually understand what had happened, it was spreading false information and ultimately information that doesn't help keep anyone safe. So the first thing I asked was, why has this not happened yet? Why are these cases reported 
why is it skipping around? Not this again. Um, why are these cases being reported in this way? I think the signal might be interfering with next door. This happened yesterday. Could you just move me on to the next slide? Keep it on this one. Okay, so I spent three months on the phone asking people, why has this not happened yet? I spoke to the Samaritans, a charity in the UK who um, do suicide prevention, and they've managed to really change the way that papers report suicide. In the UK, it's really, it's treated very, very sensitively. Journalists know that if someone has killed themselves, they cannot write about the methods that they used. And they have to be really careful because it could encourage other people to use the same methods. They know that, right? So we wanted to do the same thing with domestic homicide because just as suicide is a public health problem and seen as a public health problem, we wanted to shift the consciousness from seeing domestic homicide as a woman's problem or an identity problem to a health problem that everybody has a role in changing, including the press, especially the press. I spoke to domestic abuse experts. I spoke to um, excellent journalists, including Mega, um, who had a huge part, and I'll reference one of her suggestions in the slides because it was one of the most helpful. Um, but essentially, the message I got from domestic abuse experts was, this is like this needs to change. It's been happening for years. We have to do something about it. The message I got from journalists was, just make it as simple as possible. <laughs> so I had the academic saying, you have to have everything here. It has to be accurate. And the journalist saying, don't give us too much because no one's, gonna, no one's going to read a policy report. It's not helpful. And also, journalists get so much criticism and attack all the time. So if you're another person just saying, you need to do this, you're awful, it's not, it's not helpful and it's not constructive. Um, and most importantly, two people who I spoke to at the beginning of the campaign who have worked throughout it are two brothers called Luke and Ryan Hart at the bottom. So Luke and Ryan Hart are survivors of domestic abuse. Their father killed their mother and their sister in 2016, just a few days after she had separated from him. The media reporting around their case was disgusting. He was referenced as a nice guy, a DIY nut. There was speculation that he, the woman had had an affair. There was um, speculation on the house prices. It was, it was really disrespectful. And what's even more concerning is that when the police took Luke and Ryan's father, um, his computer for evidence, they found in his internet search history, he had been searching articles of men who had killed their wives because he was looking for a narrative to justify what he was planning to do and what he did do. And that's something I say to journalists every time I run a training on this, is that you don't know who is reading your article. So, question I had to ask, who has the power to make this change? I heard a lot from journalists that the regulatory body in the UK that, that kind of cuts across all standards um, is IPSO, the Independent Press Standards Organization. Um, this is the press regulator in the UK, and I was told, if you want to make any changes, you kind of have to have their, their badge or their backing on it, otherwise no one's going to take you seriously, because everyone's telling us what to do all the time, but actually, they're the ones who roll out the editorial code, they're the ones who kind of support guidance. So, I approached Ipso, and one of the first things that they said to me um, in a meeting was, well, we uh, run our our standards on, based on complaints that we get. So if we get complaints about an issue, then we will review it with the editor's board, and then we will make changes. We looked into this, and we haven't had any complaints about the way fatal domestic abuse is reported. And the woman sitting next to me was uh, a leading criminologist in the UK called Jane Monkton-Smith, and she said, you haven't had complaints because the women are dead. So the complaint system is completely flawed. We knew we had to find a way to get this change and we knew it wasn't going to come through that mechanism. So we knew we needed to build a case to win. We needed to prove the harmful consequences of bad reporting, do that complaints work, prove that we're the experts, bring the voices of survivors and their family and members to the centre because, as Mega said, people need to be telling their own story, not the version of events that the journalists want. And actually, we often see with domestic homicide, there's a, there's a narrative that people want. They want the kind of tempestuous love story that ends in tragedy, but actually it's so inaccurate and it's so unhelpful. Ultimately, we also wanted to show the public are ahead of the press and the press needs to catch up. So we used a framing of dignity. I say this because dignity is a universal kind of values framing. As feminists, we often talk about harm, but unfortunately not everybody cares about harm. However, dignity is a universal value that 
people often will not at surface value disagree with. So the first thing we said in our messaging was everyone deserves dignity in death. You know, we have this saying, don't speak ill of the dead. People can't can defend themselves. Everyone deserves dignity and death. Current media reporting denies victims of that dignity. We need reporting that upholds victims' dignity. So we ran a media-driven campaign. This was our strategy um, because we wanted them to recognize it was a problem and it needed fixing. This is what we wanted the shift in journalists to be. We knew that, well, we'd heard, sadly, that in a newsroom when a woman's been murdered, people would say, oh, was she attractive? Was she pretty? Can we find a picture? We wanted to change that for them to think, okay, someone's been murdered. I need to be very careful in how I approach this because it has huge consequences. We also know that they would break stories immediately without all of the facts and often kind of the urgency to be the first publication to have the, the story out would mean that things weren't accurate. So we did want them to also prioritize accuracy and sensitivity. So if that meant waiting till you had more information, then wait. It's better reporting. It's better storytelling. It's, it's, it's better. So these were the four points. We created guidance um, based on four points. Accountability, images, dignity, accuracy. It's summarized as ADA. So accountability is place responsibility on the perpetrator. Don't describe the murder as an uncharacteristic event. Men who murder women are very controlling. The most controlling thing you can do is to take someone's life. It's not romantic. And also, don't, avoid, don't make the perpetrator into a monster. It's not helpful to say someone's an evil monster. And often, abuse relies on manipulation. Men who are horrible to their partners are the most charming men you could ever meet. There was a woman who, um, called Natalie Hemming who was murdered in the UK. And her sister will always say her husband could sell ice to Eskimos. He was so charming. So... Second part of accountability is to not include spurious triggers for a murder. So don't frame the killing after a woman's actions or a row, you know. There's a, a headline here from Coronavirus Times in the lockdown. Husband strangled wife for 44 years to death after a late night argument in coronavirus lockdown. Now, millions of people are in coronavirus lockdown. That is absolutely not an excuse. And yet that's what he had come up with as his legal defense. And that was what was the narrative that was reinforced, that he'd lost control and it, it, lockdown had made him crazy. We know that his wife was found dead, strangled in the doorway with her keys in her hand, which suggests that she was trying to leave. Third point is avoid sympathetic romanticized language. So Jane Monkton Smith has written a brilliant book called Murder, Gender and the Media, which talks about how in court, when men say they love their partner so much they had to kill them, there's actually more sympathy from them and they get a lighter sentence. How ridiculous is that? But it happens. There's this really strange kind of like Romeo and Juliet cultural phenomenon about love being a madness that consumes you when actually it's the most unloving thing you could ever do. So we just need to do away with this altogether because actually... It almost creates sympathy for the man when actually a woman's been murdered. That should be the centre. Finally, um, number one rule of journalism is that everyone has the right to reply. Dead women don't get the right to reply. So you have to be their counter. You have to be that voice who will challenge the perpetrator's narrative. Images. We saw a lot of problems with images. So we say centre images of the victim and don't prioritise the perpetrator. We also say you know, use the image that the family have provided. I'll speak to two examples. So um, on the left is Raneem Uday. Her, um, her mother and her were murdered by a very violent partner. This was the image that the family sent via the police. And yet um, the press decided to go through her Facebook and find an older picture of her without her hijab. And that was the image that went across the press. And then on um, Beth Aspie's case, I grew up with Beth. She was murdered last year by a man who she'd known for one year. The press created these um, composite images of her face next to the perpetrator's face. You see this a lot. And it was so distressing to have her put on an equal footing with a man who was still alive, who had murdered her, who had made her life hell for a year. And ultimately, she was dead. Why were they putting them next to each other? Um, so there are two common things that we see. Uh, third is obvious dignity. You know, it's really important that journalists remember that a family will read over and over this coverage because it's a public record of someone's life and death. We really made that point. It's one story out of how many for you, but for these families, you know, it's a, it's a lasting record. And Luke and Ryan Hart will say the article should be a memorial for the victim, not propaganda for the perpetrator. 
Um, and finally, accuracy, hello, number rule of journalism um, is that accuracy is most important. It's about truth. So we say, call it domestic abuse, not a tragedy, not a horror, not a bloodbath, not a monster. All of this fantastical language is so inaccurate. Call it what it is. And put, an, put a reference to the domestic abuse helpline at the bottom. So um, this is what the guidelines look like. And credit to Mega for this idea on the left, because she said, look, just draw up what not to do and people will remember it. So that's what the guidelines opens with. And you can see it on the Level Up website. You can, you can view the full guidelines. Um, and we launched with a press campaign. We had lots of media coverage um, featuring survivors of domestic abuse, family members who had lost their loved ones, criminologists writing columns about it. We kind of had this media blast on one day. And then um, we launched a public petition saying that this needs to change. We had 20,000 signatures overnight. There was a huge issue. And the press regulator emailed me within an hour of coming off TV. And they said, we'd like to talk to you. The reason we did this was because we wanted to prove the public were ahead of the press. And by doing that public launch and showing there was so much support, instead of us kind of politely knocking um, at their door and saying, hey, um, you know, we know what we're doing on this. We, uh, we'd like to talk to you. We wanted to build power and show that we were the experts. And that's what we did. And they invited us to the table. Um, these were two meetings I had with Ipso. Again, always bringing family members to the fore, always bringing experts with me. And eventually, they backed the guidelines. So the press regulator, although they have an editorial code um, that they kind of enforce clauses on, um, they didn't put it into their code, but they have put the guidelines on their website. They do promote our trainings. They will circulate the news of our trainings. And I am every month training journalists on how to report fatal domestic abuse. Um, and it's an ongoing project. But I just wanted to talk you through kind of how, how we went about doing it and how we managed to frame... Um, a feminist issue into a health issue and how we managed to use the language that we knew our audience listened to, dignity, accuracy, truth, to actually communicate messages around safety, victim blaming and, you know, ultimately feminism.